Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, which is episode 12 of Association Continuity in a COVID World. Uh, my name is Jordan Goldman. I'm the Executive Vice President at Castle Group. And uh, for those of you used to seeing Craig Vaughn on uh, today's webinar, I'm sitting in for him today. Uh, and for those of you who don't know Castle Group, we specialize in the management of condos and HOAs in Florida. And we partner with uh, roughly 300 associations with seven offices throughout the state. And we have almost 1,800 teammates. Uh, welcome back for those that are rejoining us, and uh, welcome to those that are uh, new to the webinar as well. Uh, as a reminder, you just heard, uh, you're welcome to ask questions throughout the Q&A, and uh, we'll attempt to work those into the discussion. Uh, by the way, if any of us is joining us for the, uh, the 12th time, being our 12th webinar, please chat into the chat and let us know. We'd be interested to hear from you. Uh, we are going to continue with polling this week. Uh, we do encourage you to answer quickly. The polling questions will come up, and we'll take them down once we have enough answers. Uh, so that being said, I think we can start with our first polling question to get a feel for who we have in the audience today. Uh, so Marinus, would you mind posting the first polling question for the audience? Uh, while you're answering the question, I do want to welcome back uh, Mike. Uh, welcome back, Michael, and welcome Allison, who's sitting in for Jeff Rembaugh. Uh, and before I ask them to introduce themselves, I just want to remind everybody that they're here to um, provide some discussions and thoughts not necessarily provide legal advice for your association. Um, so we'll do our best to answer your questions. And um, but if anything specific that you need to know about your specific association, we do recommend you reach out to your association council. Uh, so that being said, uh, let me turn it over to you, Michael and Allison, to, uh, for some introductions. Thanks, Jordan, and welcome, Allison. Welcome. It's good to be here. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending as we continue on this COVID roadshow. Uh, just want to briefly talk about K. Bender Rembaum. We are a law firm specializing in the representation of Florida's community associations, uh, some, uh, occasionally some developers and uh, owner claims. We represent in excess of 1,200 associations. We have 19 lawyers, eight of us, Allison and myself included, are board certified experts in the field of condominium plan development law. And we pride ourselves on combining this experience in community association law with excellent customer service. Our offices are in Broward County, Palm Beach County, Hillsborough County, and we do have offices by appointment in Miami-Dade County as well. We publish regularly two news publications, Legal Morsels, written by our, my partner Robert Kay, focusing on new court cases and legislation relevant to community associations, and my other partner, Jeff Rembaum, who does Rembaum's Association Roundup, uh, which has uh, an articles numbering over 250 that focus on new court cases and legislation as well as other matters affecting board members and managers and members of community associations in Florida. Uh, Robert Kay also hosts a monthly community association radio show, Ask the Experts, the first Thursday of each month. And our fellow attorney, Peter Mullingarden, hosts a weekly radio show on condo, called Condo Solutions every Monday from nine to 10. Which you, hopefully many of you know, we provide numerous monthly webinars in addition to these on a whole variety of association subjects of interest and are well known for providing one of the most informative board member certification webinars. We encourage everybody to attend, they're all free. We also are very active on the legislative front for community associations. Attorney Sean Brown, who's in our Hillsborough County office, and Allison here with us today, are actively involved with the Florida Bar's Condominium and Plan Development Committee. And I have the pleasure and the honor of serving on the Florida Legislative Alliance. I'm its current chair. Uh, that's the legislative arm of Community Associations Institute. And so we're happy again to be here. Jordan, we want to thank you and Castle once again for having us and look forward to a great show. Our pleasure. Well, one of the things that we want to talk about today is it's interesting, you know, through the registration process, uh, it really gives everybody that's attending an opportunity to ask questions. And we take those questions, we look at them and we work them into an agenda to answer as many as we can from what you've submitted, in addition to building in what's, uh, what you submitted through the QA. So I can tell you, we've received a lot of questions about phase two and how it impacts associations obviously your residents and the amenities. Um, but there may be some misnomers involved in that. We're hoping to clear some of that up today. Um, but before we do that, we want to give an update on the statewide orders. So that being said, let's take a look at the agenda and walk through kind of what we're expecting to uh, where the conversation will take us today. First of all, as I mentioned, we'll have a, uh, an update on the current statewide orders. Uh, we'll have a continuation discussion on emergency powers. Uh, we're going to look at phase two. And the question that we really want to ask is, what does that really mean? Um, there's some questions already coming in through the chat, all in relation to phase two. So we're hoping to spend a chunk of the meeting on that today. Uh, we are going to talk about board of membership meetings. That was probably the second largest chunk of questions that came in uh, in relation to technology and maybe what's changed in a, a COVID world. And then we're going to get to a kind of a speed round of QA. 
uh, and we'll go through again as many questions as we can that are submitted and work those into the conversation. Uh, so that being said, uh, let's take a look at the results of the first question and see who's in our audience today. So it looks like uh, we're roughly uh, two thirds condo and one third HOA, which is the split we've been seeing. Um, and I think the reality is there are some nuances between the association type that you're in, but there's a lot of overlap. Uh, so the conversation today should um, really cover all those things. Um, so before we get into the meat of the discussion, uh, we thought it would make sense to recap and provide an update on the current statewide orders. Uh, Michael, perhaps you can take this one and give us a brief overview of where we are today. Absolutely. And, and to the extent uh, we do remember, and when Allison and I are sharing uh, legal points of guidance, as Jordan said, not advice, we will try to differentiate if it's HOA versus condo. As a, and if we don't, uh, it's safe. It, it, you can presume it's the same. Uh, but again, if, when it comes to specifics, you'll check with your legal counsel. Uh, with regard to a brief overview, and I will try to be brief, uh, I do want to say the uh, Governor DeSantis did extend the state of emergency, so we are continuing to be in the state of emergency through November 3rd. Uh, we will, obviously, we have that, that is now still about six weeks away, so we will see what happens between now and then as to whether it gets extended, but for now we are through November 3rd, so there is that quote-unquote breathing room, if you will. Uh, the, uh, also, the uh, moratorium on evictions and on foreclosures has been extended till October 1st. That seems to be a monthly extension. So uh, whether that will be extended through October into November, we'll find out. But for now, it's to October 1st. Uh, I just briefly want to remind everyone the foreclosure moratorium is, does not impact associations being able to pursue foreclosure, not saying that that is something that you would aggressively or actively be doing. It is something to look at on a case-by-case -case approach. But the foreclosure moratorium does not impact an association foreclosure. That said, uh, if you have a tenant who is uh, not an owner who is not paying and you are able to go after the tenant for the rent, if the tenant doesn't pay the rent under the statute, you'd have the right to evict. That is on temporary hold. You cannot evict a, uh, a tenant whose owner is not paying the, the maintenance and the tenant refuses to pay the rent. So that's something to be aware of, but that's in effect still till October 1st. There's been no new county orders on amenities specifically, and that's something we'll be discussing further uh, as we get into the, the webinar. But I do also want to remind everyone, uh, we talk in terms of a state, we talk in terms of county. There are many municipalities who might have issued orders. We're not going to get into specific municipalities here at all, but I encourage you to check if your local municipality has any specific orders, because as we pointed out throughout our time doing this, county excuse me, state, county, municipality, association, the municipality might have an order that's more restrictive than the county or the state, as well the association might have something that's more restrictive. It just can't be less restrictive. So there's four layers you need to be looking at. Allison? Very, very helpful. Allison, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, Michael, you well covered all of the state orders, but I know a lot of our viewers are here in Palm Beach County. And as to Palm Beach County, you are correct, there's nothing really earth shattering with respect to amenities, but our mask facial covering order has been extended now till October 22nd. As you probably know, there's no statewide mask order that is, we've seen that at the county level, but here in Palm Beach County, it's extended all the way till October 22nd. I see that going probably even further for a while longer. Also, just to briefly mention, there was a order a couple weeks back opening up playgrounds for Palm Beach County under specific guidelines. So if I could mention a couple, those are specific now to once again, Palm Beach County only. Yeah. And thanks, Allison. And, and, and that's a good point. Palm Beach does seem to be issuing very specific orders and more frequently, certainly than Broward and Miami-Dade. Broward and Miami-Dade do have those facial mask orders in place. To my knowledge, they have not expired. There was no deadline on them. All, so that means all three counties continue to have these face mask orders in place. Great. I appreciate that. I think that um, while not a lot's changed, uh, we're looking every week or every other week to see if there's any movement. And so having that update is obviously very helpful. Let's, let's talk about, let's shift gears a bit here and go to our second bullet point, which is uh, the continuation of emergency powers. It's come up a bunch of times in the submissions that came in um, as we led in the registration process. And we already had a number of questions chatted in in relation to uh, the emergency powers question. So I think it makes sense to stop here and, and talk a bit about the topic. Uh, Allison, maybe I'll come to you first for this one, if that's okay. Yes, sure. I mean, as we all know, and we've been talking about it for weeks, 
associations, both condo, HOA, co-op, have emergency powers to deal with damage in the event of a state of emergency, which we're still under. And Michael mentioned it's uh, going on till November 3rd at this point. So we're clearly within the emergency power statute right now. Uh, but once again, the statute is only for the time and to deal with things reasonably necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the association and the residents, and to help mitigate damage to the property. So while it is ongoing, it doesn't allow for you to do whatever you want. It has to be as necessary as the times change. So we have frequently received a lot of questions somewhat uh, mixing up the state of emergency with something being an emergency. Just because we're under a state of emergency right now and emergency powers are authorized under reasonable circumstances, it doesn't mean that everything is an emergency. For example, just a couple examples, the, both 718 and 720 condos and HOAs, there's a section regarding contracts and bidding requirements. And under that provision of the of the those acts, you're allowed to, you're, you're, you're not required to get bids in the event of an emergency. So if there's a true emergency and you frankly cannot go get bids for work, that is suspended. But that doesn't mean that just because we're in the state of emergency and there's emergency powers in effect that you're not required to get bids for, for matters that are frankly unrelated to the state of emergency. So I think you, you can think of it like that. We had a lot of confusion regarding holding meetings and that typically in the event of an emergency, you're not required to have notice for a meeting. But here, it's debatable whether we're really in such an emergency where no notice of a board meeting or other meeting is required. And I think we're going to probably talk a whole lot more about that. That's, that's yeah. excellent points, Allison. I think, uh, and we will talk further about uh, the notice requirements, but a notice as practicable does not mean you blow off the notice requirements, guys. We'll get into that later on when we talk about meetings specifically, but, but please be not be aware of that. You do have to notice your meetings, even, uh, even when they're an emergency, <laughs> give them some kind of notice. And I think it's also just important to emphasize that, and Michael, I know you have a comment on this as well, that once the state of emergency ends November 3rd, I believe, that the powers don't just automatically disappear in our firm's opinion and in the opinion of a lot of other attorneys, you still have these powers, once again, as reasonably necessary to deal with the effects of the state of emergency, the pandemic COVID. Right. And that's something we'll certainly get into in later webinars if there's any sort of indication that the state of emergency won't be extended. But the good news is right now, we're at least through November 3rd. Um, and, and Jordan, I just wanted to add one last point on emergency powers. And just to, to clarify or reiterate really uh, the points Allison made, I've been on um, some, some calls or some webinars recently where I had uh, in one a manager and another a board member who on the chat box put the emergency powers expired on June 1st. And they indicated that information came from, I guess the, the, the indication I was given that they, would get, they received that information from uh, one said their counsel, the other just basically that was their understanding. And I want to make it clear to everyone listening that uh, in my opinion, the opinion of my firm and the opinion of, of most practitioners and a large and an overwhelming majority of practitioners who do this in the state that is not the case uh, the the june 1st deadline the confusion there was secretary of uh, the dbpr halsey brashears issued an order at the end of may where he said the order he issued in march is rescinded effective june 1st and he issued an order in march that ver clarified that the emergency powers were in place due to the covid uh it go covid pandemic um, respectfully, it was appreciated that he did that, but it was not necessary. In our opinion, in the opinion of most, it was not necessary that the, the, the law supported the fact, uh, case law and otherwise supported the fact that when there is a state of emergency, these emergency powers did kick in. So when he then rescinded his order, that caused some confusion. That's the confusion apparently that was caused. But the fact that he does, his order wasn't necessary in March, so his order rescinding his unnecessary March order didn't have any impact. And as Allison correctly pointed out, those emergency powers do remain in effect while the state of emergency remains in effect and probably a short time thereafter. Thanks, Michael. That's very helpful. I mean, would it be safe to say that typically when we see this um, emergency powers being enacted, it's in the case of a hurricane that sort of comes and goes? 
And in the yeah, case and that was the confusion adopted. because when these laws were, and that's a great question, Jordan, when these laws were adopted, it was post, you know, Wilma and, and, and that those 2004, 2005 really bad hurricane seasons. Uh, and so the question became the, the word damage as, as, and I'm simplifying it greatly, but the word damage as, as set forth in the statutes is, hey, does that damage extend to the damage that the pandemic is causing? Uh, and, and there's been, uh, you know, there was, there was judge made law, judge, judges who interpreted these things and indicated, yes, damage absolutely would extend to something, including the damage we're receiving from the pandemic. And, and in a logical, practical, which isn't always what the law is or how people apply it, but let's be logical and practical. The pandemic has absolutely resulted in significant damage to associations and obviously outside of associations. So yes, that is that was the the and so when Mr. Secretary Brashears issued the order, it was helpful. It clear it confirmed what most of us believed. Uh, when he rescinded his order, it just caused confusion. Uh, and and I want to I want to unconfuse that by letting everybody know that it's our opinion. And I will say that there's been no further legal challenge. No one has brought this to the DBPR. No one has brought this to a court of law to say, to clarify, hey, are they or aren't they? I think the overall overwhelming belief is these continue in play. And as Allison also correctly pointed out, as associations in their governing documents have health, safety, welfare uh, requirements and obligations that this would also piggyback on. Right. Well, I guess the good news, Michael, is if the law was 100% practical and logical, we wouldn't have a lot of content for the webinar. So at least I can <laughs> talk about today, right? Um, well, that being said, I think that gives us a good update on uh, emergency powers. It answers a lot of the questions that came in, and so we appreciate that, both of you. Uh, maybe we can move into sort of the meat and potatoes of the meeting today, which is, you know, phase two and what it really means. Uh, but before we do that, we'd like to post another polling question and get a sense of uh, what the viewers are doing in respect to their amenities. So we'd like to separate this and talk, uh, ask HOAs first and then condos. So first of all, for those who live in an HOA only, We'd like to know what you've done with your amenities. So you'll see the, the polling questions that are posted. And we'll leave this up for a few minutes and, um, and get everybody's responses. And once we do, we'll kind of talk through what we're seeing as a trend as it relates to what we've seen before. And uh, once we close the HOA question, we'll move into the condo one and have a very similar discussion. And uh, then we'll move into, the, again, the meat and potatoes of the discussion. Marinus, I think we can go ahead and, uh, and close that question and post the results. So it looks like we have a pretty even split um, uh, from what we've seen last time compared to now. Uh, we are seeing some folks that are opening pools. And again, you can see the answers here in front of us. Uh, but it looks like there's not a lot of movement, guys, between uh, our last webinar and this one as it relates to opening pools and gyms. Any, any thoughts on that, Allison, Michael? I'm surprised. I think they're lower than I expected as far as what's open. Right. Allison, any thoughts? Agreed. Okay. And, and I don't say that in any judgmental kind of way, just sort of an a, a observation. Uh, you know, one thing we'll reiterate throughout is if, if you're not comfortable opening your amenities for, for a number of reasons, and obviously you should be communicating with your management team, with your legal counsel, if you're not comfortable opening amenities or you don't think you can handle it or you've tried and it's failed, they should be closed. Right. And we've seen a lot of outdoor amenities, you know, open up, but indoor amenities, I feel, have uh, not rolled out as quickly as outdoor, obviously, for the re health reasons. Yeah, so that, that's, that's sort of what I've seen. That's what we're seeing as well. And I think what's interesting is we, as we have these polling questions every other week, and we watch the trends. We haven't seen a big shift yet. And that's, I think, why we keep asking the similar questions to see if, you know, we do have that. Um, Let's go ahead and post the questions in relation to condos and see if we have a similar result uh, in regards to the trend. And again, we'll leave this up for about 30 seconds, uh, give everybody a chance to answer, and then we'll take a look at uh, the results that come in and see if we uh, identify any trends that are different than uh, we're seeing with our HOAs. Okay, Meredith, I think we can go ahead and, uh, and close the poll and post the results. Interesting. Uh, again, the trend line compared to what we've seen uh, in previous uh, webinars is still holding. Michael, Alice, I think you both agree. Um, again, not, not incredibly surprising, but we are sort of looking for that moment where we turn the curve as, uh, 
on, uh, on our amenities being open. And I think what's going to happen as we have the rest of this discussion is we're going to talk a bit about uh, some of the misnomers and what phase two really means. And maybe that's why we're not seeing a big shift, right? right. Uh, mm -hmm. Phase two may not be as impactful for our associations as our commercial partners at restaurants and retailers. So let's go ahead and um, have a bit of a discussion around uh, the questions we've received in regards to what phase two means. And while we can't answer them all specifically, I think it's worth getting into uh, a discussion around what we are seeing and what it really does mean to our HOA and our condo friends. Michael, maybe I'll turn it over to you to, to jump in on that conversation first. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, it's in, and, and Jordan, your point was, was spot on as far as, as what we're seeing in the polls. And it was, it's interesting that uh, in, an, uh, in the condominium setting, the percentage of, of pools open was substantially higher than, than we saw in the HOA setting. Uh, although there are, uh, and that's even with a lot more uh, two-third, one-third uh, listeners, uh, I, I imagine maybe there's a little more pressure on the condominium boards to be opening these pools. Uh, perhaps that's part of it. But uh, uh, I think a big point is, as you said, is phase two. It's also phase two is new. We're, we're a couple of weeks in uh, at most, and, and, and people are still trying to get an understanding of what quote-unquote phase two actually means. Uh, you know, an individual I know had posted one of these questions, and it's also something I've observed where we had been doing quite well with the, the numbers that have been reported, uh, and uh, there's been a slight uptick uh, in, in the, the positive tests uh, as of the last couple of days, and so people are sort of like, you know, got their, 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 their eyebrows up and what that actually means. But you're right, phase two certainly does impact the commercial establishments uh, that was the, that's the intent of phase two. Um, one thing I'd mentioned in earlier uh, webinars, uh, and I didn't mention early on is I, I was, uh, on the task force that the governor had uh, put together for, uh, businesses in the state of Florida, uh, called reset and the best way to open up and, and address liability issues. And, and I was, I was there as the, the businesses I represented were us, the community associations. All of us were not for profit corporations and we wanted a seat at that table. And, um, but there's no question that the, the, the dialogue and discussion with regard to phase two is addressed toward those for-profit businesses and, and how those they can, they can start reopening and getting the economy going here. So there's not a lot of uh, uh, impact uh, as we get into. But some questions that we've gotten have to do with, uh, and I don't even know if this is so much phase two, but we had questions coming in where owners are now returning. Our snowbirds, quote unquote, are starting to return uh, from, from the north. And, and I think, and, and whether there should be a wait period on them. And I, and, and, and I want to point out, there was uh, earlier in the summer, earlier in, 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 I guess it goes back April, May, June, uh, there was a quarantine requirement for uh, people traveling from uh, hotspots, the Tri-County area in particular. Uh, that is no longer in effect. Uh, Governor DeSantis has removed that requirement. It's no longer in effect. And, and it's, it's, Based on, on, in part on that, I suppose we might start seeing people come back. Although when the, uh, the numbers are stronger as far as uh, lower percentages in the North than they are here in the South, I'm not sure how many people are running down here <laughs> at this point. Uh, but that quarantine order is no longer in effect. Uh, and so with regard to whether you can require, should people wait or require them to wait? Uh, it's our opinion and Allison, if Allison, Allison can add this if she'd like, uh, there is no reasonable basis to say to someone, you can't use the amenities because you've just come from out of town. Uh, now that 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 now that the uh, quarantine is no longer in effect, so uh, you know, to me, I, the way I, the way I think I look at it is uh, with that quarantine being lifted, if individuals are now being able to go, in, re, re, Florida residents are going out to restaurants, going out now now with phase two, you know, movie theaters and other things are open. Um, I'm not sure that there's a, a, a significant difference in them going to these locations at quote unquote exposure versus someone who's come from the north, and especially if someone drove from the north, didn't even fly. Uh, so I don't believe that, that uh, you'd have a reasonable basis to require a wait period to use the amenities uh, if your amenities are open. I agree. I, I think all the uh, emergency powers once again have to be reasonable. Your board made rules have to be reasonable. And I think that backing that up would be a little bit difficult, uh, most likely, it, unless circumstances really change and that we have an influx in a certain area and we are set back to where we were a couple months ago. I think that, Michael, you're completely correct. On phase two, 
because I want to get back a little bit to the more of the details of phase two and how it's relevant to associations here, that I will just note that in phase one, the state order provided that groups of more than 10 people should not congregate together. And in phase two, the order provides that you should avoid congregating in groups larger than 50 people. So now that Palm Beach, Broward, and Dade have now joined phase two of the plan, the 50 person limit is applicable, but we all need to be cognizant that the 50 person limit does not supersede any association restrictions that have been put in place reasonably, or even more importantly, any specific county or local code restriction concerning the number of people or occupancy of a certain uh, part of your facilities. So we do have this 50 person increase, I guess, 50 person increase. And I, I see that relating more towards maybe holding meetings and not necessarily obviously use of gym and other other uh, clubhouse facilities. Back on gym, that was actually part of phase two that now gyms can open at full capacity. So obviously you still have to socially distance and comply with all of the sanitation requirements, but I could see associations who were sort of on board with these uh, governmental restrictions that they were following those as their guidelines that now they open back up their gym uh, at more capacity or they use that as sort of like a baseline. Uh, in right. terms right. of phase two, otherwise, as Michael points out, it's really relating to uh, different types of businesses that can open that are not really necessarily relevant to all of our associations. Right. Uh, and I think, I, Jordan, that was good. I just want to make, I want to give an example to what Allison's saying to clarify, make sure we're all on the same page, the listeners. So using Broward, because Broward's order, uh, the Broward County order, in my, uh, in my opinion, is a little bit easier to follow, for example, than the Miami-Dade order. Uh, and, and Broward County, it's, they have requirements that, has far as, that haven't been changed as far as I'm aware, for fit, that require maximum 50% occupancy in your community room, in your fitness center. So the fact that phase two might allow a, a commercial gym to now open it at full occupancy, which quite frankly, I, I, I did not, I don't know, recognize that. Uh, I, the gym I'm at, they haven't, hopefully not gonna do that. Um, but if, if, the, if in fact some, the order that the, the phase two says, hey, you can open wider, uh, the county can be more restrictive, remember that. And the county order is in place at 50% capacity for, a, for community associations. This is specific to community associations. And so, and you association can be even more restrictive. And this is, there is no one size fits all when we come to talking about these. I had two clients call me yesterday about fitness centers. One said, we have a fitness center that we're lucky three people can fit in there at a time. Another says, we have a fitness center, which is, you know, can fit 150 people. And so the, so how they decide to address what they want to do with that particular amenity in line with what's in place now in the county uh, in the state, in the county, in their municipality, is is something that is going to be addressed on a case by case approach. So what that's that's to the point we're trying we're giving general advice, but you do want to get with your management team and with your legal counsel to determine what works best for you, what is in compliance with the law, uh, and ultimately, again, I want to reiterate: if you're not comfortable opening for good reasons, then you are not obligated to yet open. That doesn't mean you won't get pushback from owners, uh, and we can discuss, you know, and we've discussed in the past what that means as far as exposure to liability, but the, the fact that the, the phase two says, hey, you can now have more people, up to 50 people, if your community room does not fit, only fits 50 people, you can't put everybody in there. Your capacity is still at 50% in Broward, so you couldn't put more than 25 in there with social distancing, and as Allison and I both said earlier, mask requirements remain 100% in place in all three counties, especially indoors. Right. And Michael, I think that's the source of some of the confusion, and we can tell that from the questions that we received through the chat and through the QA, that when they see pool or fitness center in the phase two orders, they want, sometimes there's a, a thought to apply that to a community facility, right? Mm -hmm. And the reality is your, your commercial facilities are different than your association facilities. And to your point, there's different size or sizes, capacity requirements, all of those things that come into play. Yes. You have to use good judgment as we apply these rules because uh, it is not a one size fits all. And that's, that's why it's hard to answer some of these questions, frankly. Yeah. Allison, yeah. I, I, I do want to mix in some questions we received as they apply to the conversation we're having. So I may jump around a little bit here. Sure. But one of the 
frequently asked questions we've had is um, whether guests should be allowed to use the pool or gym if they sign a waiver. Uh, and I know we've had some discussion around pools and gyms. I know this is a touchy one, but a lot of questions came in around this as, as it relates to guests. Any thoughts, guys? Well, I know in Broward, guests are not permitted to use facilities unless they're the family member of a resident and the association has actually elected to allow that non-resident family member to use the facilities. So that's a specific Broward rule that I know of. Um, here in Palm Beach County, we don't have any local code or local order restriction on guest use of facilities. So that's sort of like a business judgment thing. I, I certainly think the emergency powers would back up uh, restrictions on guest use of facilities at this point. I think you could try to have a waiver to sort of curb the guest use or limit it. That's really what it re results in. Um, obviously, the, the pushback would be that that's not reasonable or, or it somehow conflicts with your recorded governing documents. But I think that you could, uh, I think you have a good chance of attempting to get that waiver from a guest and how good the waiver is, is another, is another matter. Right. Right. That's all that, point. Yeah. And, and if I may, I, I can just, you know, to, on that point, I don't know if that's something that we have to bring up later on waivers, but I'll mention it now uh, since we're on the subject of waivers. And I think the issue, the issue with waivers uh, is, will it really afford protection? I, I think that, well, waivers in general are disfavored in the state of Florida. Uh, but uh, and I, the way I express it is I think a waiver can be a good deterrent. Uh, as far as if someone, if someone is, is somehow is using a, an amenity or facility and, and something happens and they've signed a waiver, so maybe they don't think that they have any, uh, that, that may deter them from pursuing further. But, but boards and, and should not be under any misconception that if you're negligent in any way, if you're not following the requirements of the state, county, municipality, or even your own governing documents, uh, and, and it, for example, if you're opening up amenities and, and the guests are there, or even residents are there, have signed a waiver. Uh, that waiver is not going to insulate you from your own negligence or intentional mis malfeasance. So, so keep in mind that a waiver is something that can be effective. Uh, and, and in certain instances, yes, obviously a waiver might be enforceable if it has to do with a legal, a, a pending legal action. But in general, having a waiver, you're not going to waive be able to. You're certainly not going to be able to waive away your own negligence. And while we're on this topic, I think it's important to note that I think uh, signage is probably a very good idea in addition to trying to do these waivers. I think signage is, is a great thing to have. A lot of these local orders require certain signage. The Palm Beach order does with respect to pool use. It says you have to uh, install a sign providing that the user bears the full risk of utilizing the community pool. You have to post the CDC guidelines and social distancing guidelines. So maybe not thinking about waiver so much, but a signage would be even more important in some instances. Absolutely. That's a great point, Allison. In fact, Palm, right, Palm Beach absolutely mandates signage at the pools. And my reading of Miami-Dade's order, and again, uh, with respect to the Miami-Dade uh, uh, officials, uh, that they, they, they have an order that refers to a, a plan, a, a plan which is about a hundred page booklet. So it's not quite as, as simple as, as we've seen in Palm Beach and Broward as far as explaining, but my interpretation of that is signage is also necessary in Miami-Dade. So uh, that's something to be in Broward. You are encouraged to have the same type of signage as, as well. And one thing we didn't mention is as we talk about signage and, and opening up amenities, you absolutely want to be communicating with your insurance agent. You want to make sure that you are doing everything that your insurance carriers require to make sure that the coverage, first of all, you want to make sure you have good coverage in case of, but then you also want to make sure that you're not giving your insurance carrier an easy out because you had a requirement, you know, under, under either a state, county, local uh, order, or under your policy to do or something or have something in writing, signage or otherwise, that you don't have. So by all means, communicate with your insurance agent Get, get with, if you haven't already, after all our webinars, I hope that you've at least sat down with your agent at least once, but get with them and make sure you're doing what you need to be doing. That's something your good management team will help you with as well, but I can't encourage that enough. It's interesting you both brought up signage, and I'm sitting here looking at a question about signage at water fountains. Uh, one of the questions that came in was, should we have signage at our water fountains? I think we've now addressed that, but... Uh, I didn't think water fountains are, I don't think water fountains are open yet, are they? I didn't think so. 
I don't think, and, and I know hot tubs are still closed to, uh, to um, Kim McCauley. Hot tubs, as far as I'm aware, are all still closed indoor and outdoor. Would that, Michael, would that apply to water fountains, in, interior water fountains, like near a gym or a gym facility as well, yeah. in an HOA or a condo? I, I, to be, I will be very honest, everybody. I have not looked specifically at, at anything regarding water fountains. My understanding, though, is water fountains, uh, those are not yet open. I did not think hot tubs were open. Certainly, I know indoor hot tubs and showers and things are not uh, may an outdoor hot tub possibly, Kim? So that's something that would need to be followed up with directly with your with your local council. Okay, so I guess the synopsis there is: before we post signs, let's make sure we can use the facility first, right? Right. Uh, let's uh, let's talk a bit about a little bit more about amenities. And one of the questions that came in is interesting to talk about, which is the leasing and renting out of your facilities. So practical and applications aside, uh, let's maybe have a little bit of a legal discussion around thoughts on implications if an association allows the facilities to be rented as they did pre-COVID. Any thoughts on that topic? Good, awesome. I think, I mean, this is a board discretion depending on what's going on at your facility and frankly, how much space you have, I think is probably the number one here. I think a board could authorize it and this is a case where they probably don't have the right to use it in that manner and which you could probably uh, ask for a waiver with certain certain stipulations regarding, you know, fees for sanitation before and after and indemnification, liability insurance issues. You probably could authorize it, but I'm not so sure it would be a good idea. We've been asked uh, frequently about this issue. And again, it's ultimately the board's call, but I think it's a pretty tough decision for the board unless you have a pretty big space, just practically speaking. Yeah, and again, you're confirming that with any care, your agent, your carrier your coverages. I also want to point out, you know, when he says, can amenities be rented? I'm not quite clear, you know, or can they continue keeping them closed? Well, the, the short answer is absolutely you can continue to keep them closed if you feel that's, uh, that's your business decision. Uh, I think you can support that with getting advice from your management team, your council. Uh, but remember, again, Broward County specifically, because I don't, I Palm Beach and, and Miami-Dade, to my knowledge, don't necessarily have these restrictions, uh, but Palm, Broward specifically, amenities are not open, as Allison mentioned, to guests other than family members, and family members only if the board has adopted a rule that says family members. If the board's not adopted that, in Broward County, these amenities are open to residents only. So if someone's looking to rent an amenity, I don't know that they're looking to rent the amenity simply to have fellow residents share it. I imagine they're looking to do something to invite outside people in. And that is absolutely not permitted, at least in Broward County at this time. I think it's particularly of a concern for these indoor facilities, as I mentioned earlier. And I think it was interesting to see on the poll that I think I saw that uh, gyms are open more frequently than just indoor areas of clubhouses because I don't think boards really want people just sitting around socializing. And it, is that necessary, you know, rather than the gym where you are there to get exercise, which is more, I think in the state's opinion, even because of these state orders we had that exercise is, is, is a necessity. So I think I've seen, and the, the poll confirmed that gyms, you know, people understand that those are more necessary do you need to open the social rooms? Yeah, probably not. And yeah. you know, unless you have the space and the sanitation and the personnel and the monitoring, and you can assure compliance with all of these orders. And and, and opening up further for rentals, you know, is has to be very carefully evaluated. That's very helpful. Um, I, I hope that, uh, that discussion wasn't overly redundant. I know it tends to be a, a major topic in each one of the webinars, but. Uh, we still get a lot of questions about amenities, and we'll have a few more in the speed round there. But before we leave phase the phase two discussion, is there anything else, Allison, maybe that you want to bring up that uh, maybe is a misnomer as it relates to commercial businesses versus an association? Or Mike, either of you, any final thoughts before we move into board and membership meetings? No, I think we covered it. Yeah. There were, like we both mentioned, phase two most relevant to commercial businesses and not a real whole lot specific dealing with associations. Yeah, and phase two right now to the one of the questions is phase two uh, to our is is uh, a statewide. It's available um, each as far as I'm aware. Prior to two weeks ago or three weeks ago, every county in the state was in phase two, other than Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami Dade. Uh, the governor required uh, held off on those. He finally did open up phase two to Broward, Miami Dade, and Palm Beach. 
so long as they petitioned, it was up to the administrators of those counties. All three have basically agreed. So as far as I'm aware, the entire state is now in a phase two setting. Do we have an indication on uh, how many phases there'll be in this process? I bring that up because it's a question that just popped up. One of the questions is when will phase three happen? I don't think we can answer that one today. No. And the follow-up question to that was- Yeah, that the only thing I can say is, listen to, to, the, the, to the listeners, and I think everybody on here is probably as, edu as well, if not more educated on some of this stuff than me when it comes to if you're reading, and we're all reading similar things in that regard. The phases are supposed, you're not supposed to move to another phase until you have a minimum of 14 days of a positivity rate below 5%. That said, that's not how, how phase one, phase two, they moved into phase two well before that was established as far as I'm aware. There is a phase three, to be clear, candid, I don't quite know what phase three means other than I imagine it's gonna start allowing bars to open um, and hookah clubs, things that are still closed. And I only know who the clubs because I just read it in order. <laughs> uh, but uh, so, so those things that are still closed, I imagine that's what next phase three would be. But uh, I don't have any idea. Uh, hopefully the numbers will stay, stay good. People will continue. Even if you're not a fan of masks, wear it anyway. It seems to be effective. Uh, and, uh, and if people continue to follow the social guidelines and these things and we'll keep the numbers down, we'll hopefully be able to continue opening. So Michael, what you're telling us is that for our associations that have hookah lounges in phase three, they could potentially be reopened again. Potentially. Although, right. Remember, of course, with common amenities, you can be more restrictive. So if you want to keep those hookah lounges closed, <laughs> although like fitness centers, hookah lounges might become essential. You probably just invited a whole new stream of questions. So we'll, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> uh, well, guys, that's really helpful. Um, I think what makes the most sense is to move into our board and membership meeting discussion. Uh, I do want to make sure we save a few minutes for the QA at the end here. So I think it's a good time to stop and talk about those meetings. Um, while we have seen a shift to remote meetings using technology as we are today, frankly, uh, we are about to enter into a heavy uh, meeting season with budget approvals, annual election, annual meetings and elections. Um, let's go ahead and take a quick poll to see how frequently our audience uh, has been holding board meetings and how you're conducting them. I think this will be an interesting one for all of us. And while, while that, that question is being posed, uh, Michael and Allison, uh, how about yourselves? I mean, how, is, are you seeing any shift from predominantly digital and Zoom meetings back to in-person? Any shift on your, your side of things? Uh, no, uh, no, de definitely not a shift back to in-person meetings. Um, what, we've, what we've seen primarily, at least in my experience, and Allison will share her own, uh, my experience is we're seeing a lot of uh, the remote meetings done remotely, board meeting. If we're talking board meetings in particular, we're seeing them done remotely. Um, I have had a few that have been where the board has been uh, in person uh, and that they would have then a, a large screen where they invited the uh, residents, anyone who wanted to join would be able to join remotely. Uh, that allowed the board members to spread out in a, in a meeting room uh, and, and be able to social distance as, and then and also, but, but allow members to attend. And so the board felt they could conduct business better in, you know, while they're in one room, but obviously in compliance with Florida statutes, make sure that the owners are able to attend and speak when needing to speak. Right. So, uh, and, I, and I guess, and the one thing I will point out, because I think this is an important topic that we need to bring up to everybody listening, the emergency powers do not allow you to ignore the statutory requirements that members are allowed to attend and members are allowed to speak on agenda items, whether it be a board meeting or a membership meeting, but in particular board meetings. So if you are, when you are, other than board meetings that are allowed to be closed by law to discuss personnel matters, or if you're meeting with counsel to discuss pending, uh, pending litigation type matters, which are closed and the members aren't entitled to attend, every other board meeting should be properly noticed with board member, uh, membership allowed to attend and speak. And the question that comes, and it may or even be on the list is, and I thought I actually saw one person ask, by allowing people to speak, can we just have them type in the chat? Or do we have to open up a microphone essentially? Uh, and in my opinion, the, uh, the, the requirement of allow, being allowed to attend and allowed to speak means you're allowed to have your mic open and share your thoughts, concerns, questions, uh, and, and, and uh, not just chat. Um, I, I know that board members say, hey, it's easier if we just, we're getting, letting them, you know, ask what they want to ask and then we can address it. It'll, but I think if it's not yet been challenged uh, in a condo setting with a DBPR and an HOA setting would actually have to be someone willing to file a court action. So it's not been challenged to my knowledge, but uh, the intent of the statute, in my opinion, is pretty clear. 
as far as the need to ha- allow owners to attend, raise their hand and speak. I don't know, Allison, you wanted to, why don't you share with them what our suggestions are with regard to what they can do about that, well, the 617? You know, under emergency powers, you have to provide notice of these meetings as practicable. That's, that's the notice. So if you have no opportunity to provide notice, the meeting effectively becomes closed. I don't think we're really in those circumstances right now where there's such an emergency going on where no notice needs to be provided such you can have an effectively closed meeting. So I totally agree with Michael that you need to provide notice and you need to uh, have the meeting open. So the issue really becomes whether the opportunity to attend remotely is in compliance with your right to attend and whether it really has to be in person or not. And that's yet to be really seen or determined by uh, the division or a court or a court case here. Uh, So you do have certain options or certain things, certain tools you can use to help you in, in convening board and membership meetings here in both condo and HOA. You have just the right in the statute as it was without emergency powers to adopt reasonable rules regarding unit owner statements and frequency of comments. So I think the board could hold a meeting and adopt rules regarding how members are going to conduct themselves and speak at board meetings. Uh, And again, they have to be reasonable. They can't vitiate the right to speak whatsoever. So it has to do, as Mike said, it is a typing in the chat enough? I don't know. Is that reasonable? We'll, we'll see. Uh, even more specific, there's a process in Chapter 617, the Florida Not-for-Profit Corporate Act, that allows the board to adopt guidelines and procedures to allow members and proxy holders are of members, so this is good for annual meeting season, to remotely attend a meeting when they're not physically able to be uh, there in person. So we really do have a statute directly on point to allow members and proxy holders to attend membership meetings via Zoom, other remote platform. The statute does provide that the corporation needs to implement reasonable measures to determine who's there, how they're voting. So you have to have a system and and hold a meeting. And that's probably uh, advisable here, particularly if you're going to be taking some very important votes, such as in the election and secret ballots and all of that are a, somewhat of a separate issue we can also discuss. But and in, for example, if you're taking a vote on a very important amendment, you have a membership meeting coming up, you're going to take the vote via Zoom. Uh, most people are going to submit a limited proxy in that case, but the people who are there on Zoom should have an opportunity to vote like they would in person at the meeting. And you want to get votes here. You want to promote more voting. So it would behoove an association in that situation to adopt the protocol under 617 to more, uh, I guess it would enhance the enforceability of that amendment that you adopted remotely. And Michael, maybe you can touch on some of the election balloting issues that are bound to come up as well. Yeah, and you know, I mean, I know, Jordan, you wanted to leave some time for the, 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 the Q&A, the quick hits, and there's a bunch of good questions that re- relate to phase two. So I'd say is we have a good topic for two weeks from now. I think we can spend a good amount of time uh, really getting into the, uh, the questions on, on meetings, uh, both budget, membership, board meetings, uh, annual meetings. Uh, so, but, but I would encourage uh, those of you who are looking to hold virtual meetings, primarily in the HOA, because in a condominium, uh, in particular with an annual meeting, the condominium, the balloting is done in, in advance. Uh, in an HOA, you have a lot of HOAs where nominations are from the floor. Uh, so there are different options to use, even with a virtual setup where you might be able to, to work that. And, and I would encourage you to uh, contact your legal counsel to discuss those options. That's helpful. I can tell you from a practical standpoint, and what I find interesting is, you know, this new environment that we're in has forced us all uh, into technology, and technology we hadn't used as frequently before, like Zoom. And, you know, previous to the pandemic, we would have phone lines open for people to call in to listen to a board meeting, right? And Mm -hmm. these new platforms, not not new, but the platforms we've adopted now, allow for more dynamic meetings. So I don't see this going away anytime soon. Even when the pandemic is clear, hopefully is soon. Right. uh, This is here to stay. I hope so. I think it's fantastic. It really, it allows all professionals, I mean, listen, it allows you to have your attorneys there easier. It allows you to have your insurance professional jump on a call. You know, it allows, it allows for so much more participation and some boards, maybe that isn't the greatest thing, but quite frankly, as long as the controls and Allison's point was fantastic. 
we've talked about, even before this remote, you should be adopting reasonable rules and regulations that govern conduct at meetings. This 617 specifically addresses remote meetings in that regard, and you definitely should be communicating with your legal counsel about implementing proper guidelines that we can work with your management team and get guidelines that will fit your meetings so you have them in place. Whether they're in person or remote, you should have that. Let me go ahead and share the results, and I have them in front of me here, but they're, they're very interesting. Um, I think you see the frequency is what you would expect. You know, some associations pre, pre-pandemic were holding monthly meetings or quarterly meetings. We're still seeing that. But look at the percentage of folks that are holding remote meetings, 84%, with only 8% being in person. Obviously, there are some that are doing both, but an overwhelming majority um, are holding meetings remotely, which is what we would hope to see. Mm-hmm. And we're continuing to see, and it's not going down, apparently. Well, and I also like to see that there was 64% doing them, having their monthly meetings, and, you know, which is some sense of normalcy. <laughs> Great point. Great point. Well, let's, let's jump into the quick, quick hits. We've got about seven minutes here. So this is a speed round, guys. So we'll, uh, we'll throw them both. We'll allow them to both of you. Okay. Uh, the first one I want to address is uh, board spending and use of reserves. So, Michael, I'll throw this one to you. Okay. Does anything within the emergency powers as it relates to the pandemic come into play as it relates to board spending and use of reserves? No, go. <laughs> no, uh, honestly, there's more than that. Uh, okay. <laughs> With regard to use of reserves, I want to be very, this is, a, this is a great question, actually. Emergency powers do not per, give the board the authority to spend reserve funds without a vote of the membership, if they're for a purpose other than for what they've been delegated. The emergency powers address the potential to borrow, uh, and I quite frankly don't think you, don't, you have the right to borrow uh, under the emergency powers if you require a vote of your membership to borrow funds, you likely still need a vote of the membership to borrow funds. Please get with your association council before you address any sort of loan or borrowing process. Um, uh, but uh, the emergency powers do talk about the ability to special assess, even if your governing documents required a vote. That's something, but they do not address reserves. So uh, there is nothing in the emergency powers that gives the board the authority to spend or borrow from reserves without a vote of the membership if you're going to be using reserve funds for a purpose other than for what they've been de- designated. Let me okay. jump in. That's just for condominiums. For HOAs, reserves are somewhat different in that you have some HOAs that have unrestricted reserves. If you have unrestricted reserves, the board can use the reserves. So this is specific to right. condo reserves and restricted HOA reserves. Yeah. But- Thank you. Uh, that's a great point, Allison. And yes, I'm talking statutory reserves. Uh, and I will say, uh, and, and I appreciate that, Allison, because when an HOA has what I'm going to put in as reserves, if they're not statutory reserved in an HOA, meaning the developer didn't create them at the de- turnover, uh, at, before turnover, and or the membership did not vote to approve them, they are not statutory reserves in an HOA. They are really not, shouldn't be labeled as reserves. They're more discretionary. Uh, and, and so I speak specifically of those statutory reserves. So that's a great point, Allison. Let me throw one in that came in the chat, which I think is interesting and pertinent to our previous discussion around remote meetings. Uh, and the question is, when holding uh, Zoom or, or remote board meetings, uh, do they have to document, does a board member have to document the residents that are attending in their names? If in the past they had done it via sign-in sheet, is that important? Yes, it's important for a membership meeting specifically. You know, you're going to have to establish a quorum to hold your meeting. You need to be able to back that up. Um, so even in this chapter 617, where it's authorized that you can have remote meetings, one of the stipulations is that you have to be able to have a record of the members participation in the meeting. So you definitely have to have some type of record of who was there. Uh, and particularly if you're trying to take any action. But for a board meeting, which I, for a board meeting, Jordan, again, there is no obligation to take any sort of attendance of the owners that are present at a board meeting. The fact that someone has a sign in, and I've, I've been, I've, I've you know, obviously been invited, I've attended board meetings and they have owners signing in. I'm not quite sure why, you know, what, where that, that is something. And I, you know, again, well, let me jump in. Sometimes yeah. we have owners who, who object to the notice of the meeting. So if you're there at the meeting, you can't object to it. So that's one reason to know who's <laughs> okay. there. I can't imagine that's can't. the reason why they do the sign-in sheets, but from a legal perspective, that's a good point. <laughs> but anyway, so Jordan, to, to answer there. that question, if they have a policy where they're having owners sign in when they come in, you know, they can certainly take a roll call and have a keeper record, uh, but there's no legal obligation to do so. Right. And just a point of clarification, if I can, because I saw a few questions on this. We were talking about whether chat is an acceptable form of allowing membership membership uh, to speak at a meeting. Can you clarify that point again, Michael? 
Yeah. Um, again, it's, it's, it's an open question. It's nothing that's been determined definitively either by the DBPR in a condo setting, condo condo co-op setting, or by court, which is where an HOA complaint would go. The statutes for all say the, the owner has a right to attend and the right to speak. So the issue, the question becomes, it is, does the right to speak actually mean we, get, we have to hear you verbally, or does the right to speak mean you have the right to share your thoughts and opinions, and we're not going to unmute you, we're going to require you to type it in. My opinion... Whether, whether it's my, reasonable. Yeah, it, right. Well, my opinion is if someone has a question, you know, if someone has a question, they have a question. But if an individual ha has an, a comment they want to make and they want to be able to be heard, meaning, you know, there's, they may have, so they may, you, you, listen, we've all had this. For someone sends an email and you read their intonation into it. Someone may mean, someone wants to be able to share not only what they want to say, but how they want to say it. And I believe that it's, it's appropriate to allow them to speak. But it's not yet been, no one's brought it up to my knowledge to the division or, uh, or the, 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 in a court. So um, one more it. thing on that, you know, owners want to speak as the agenda moves forward. They want to speak on that agenda item as they hear the board discuss. So sometimes I guess you could say requiring them to put their comment in writing or, or at least in advance would definitely put them at a disadvantage because then they can't really comment on what's actually going on. In the HOA law, you're required, you can have a rule of having people sign up to speak in advance of the meeting. But again, that's just to sign up to speak. That's right. not setting forth their actual question. Great. I think that clarifies the, the questions we had that came in on the topic. Let me just close with one last sort of general topic. It's around budgeting. And uh, it's a bit of a teaser for the next meeting because I think we need to have more discussion around this. But a lot of questions coming about how to budget for COVID in 2021, right? Now, that could mean legal expenses, it could mean sanitation, it could mean pool monitoring, it could mean anything, right? Any, any quick hit thoughts on thoughts around budgeting for COVID in 2021? And again, this will be a bigger topic next meeting, but maybe a teaser or a lead into next meeting is an open a discussion around this now. I mean, I'll do it very quickly. And Jordan, before we do sign off, I would like to just address in a quick summary, a few of the questions that were posted. We can maybe go a minute or two over. Uh, but uh, with the budgets, and we did, we had a couple of weeks ago, we had Nicole on here, did a great presentation. And I think it's important that with regard to budgeting, this, uh, you want to, you're probably looking at having to increase maintenance, uh, maintenance, your maintenance line item budget. Uh, you might consider having a line item for uh, your uh, insurance deductible. That was something that was discussed. Uh, and, and quite frankly, we're at, at this point, and Jordan, I know you guys have, have also addressed this. We're seeing a small uptick, not a huge uptick in delinquencies. Uh, and, and, but, you know, come January, we don't know where, you know, we don't know if there's going to be more stimulus. We don't know what's going on and whether if this thing continues throughout the rest of the year, come January, are we looking at more and more people who are, you know, squeezed financially? So you really need to consider a line item for bad debt, I think, to address that as well. Right. Agreed. Right. So um, if I, I can... If, questions? Pardon? Anything else that you want to add to that budgeting discussion before we jump into the questions Michael wanted to One address? One thing, the technology expenses that we've been dealing with that we've never had before, not that they're huge, but they're there. Yeah, that's great. That's a good, but yeah. And when, and when I say maintenance, also think about if you're going to be, if you want to open your amenities and you require some monitoring or you want it monitored, you might have additional expenses for monitoring personnel, not only, not only cleaning supplies and things of that nature, but actual additional personnel. Get yeah, with your management team on that, and, and, but it is something to consider. Well, stay uh, tuned for more discussion on that at our next, uh, our next webinar. That's our teaser. But before we leave, and thank everybody, uh, Michael, I know there were some questions that were open from the QA chat that came that you wanted to address, so feel free yeah. to Yeah, and guys, listen, and we apologize. You're, there's a bunch of questions. We try our best to try to answer what we can in, in our topics, but um, there's, there's questions that regard to, uh, you, know, capa you know, capacities in different counties, occupancy capacities, um, you know, um, are we required to provide signage, uh, you know, in, in for certain amenities? And I think, I, I, again, I'm not, uh, basically, I'm encouraging if you are not sure, you need to reach out to your management team and, and your legal counsel to get specific guidance related to your community. Uh, signage, just in general, though, whether it's, a, whether, you know, whether the order is mandated or not, signage at all these places is recommended get with and i think your insurance agent is someone you should speak to about that about putting up proper signage about putting up of amenities and and what are what the requirements and obligations are of the residents who are going to use those amenities if you're opening and the assumption of risk um 
the uh, in Broward, our occupancy capacity is required to be posted so owners, residents know the number of 50%. Again, Georgia, again, this, you should have, a, you, I would recommend, yes, you have signage up that informs the residents who are going to use the, the, the amenities what the limitations are uh, and, and then make sure that you guys are enforcing them. Uh, in Broward County, if you remove the furniture under the way the law is written, you don't need the monitor. That doesn't mean you don't need to be sanitizing and continuing to keep things clean. And that applies across the board, guys. Someone asked, what does it mean? What's regular sanitizing? That question's never been definitively answered. I mean, in my opinion, you should be able, you should be sanitizing your pool, your bathroom areas, your, your high touch spots hourly. Um, most, but, but others may disagree. Um, but most importantly, you need to be documenting the sanitization efforts you're taking. You want to have a record that you're doing it and doing it consistently. So should someone bring a claim against you, you have documented evidence that you've done your job in accordance with the statutes. Uh, should you have an, uh, uh, someone complaining, you broke code come out saying you're vile in violation. You have the records to support uh, that you're not in violation. I mean, these are just some of these. Uh, I don't think if it, someone says, how does a 55 plus community play in the reopening process? Uh, that's it. From a legal standpoint, it doesn't have a specific impact. I think that's a personal standpoint. I think you need, I'm, I'm surmising, Gail, that when you say 55 or better community, you mean that there might be a lot more people who are in that 65 and over bracket. Uh, the susceptible. So you, you want to be more aware of who your population is and how they may be impacted by the opening of amenities. And that is a go that are, those are going to be factors in all of your factors as boards, you make your business decisions on keeping things closed, being slowly opening or even opening further. Allison, you have any you want to hit? No, nope, we're over and well said. <laughs> it's okay, we can be a couple of minutes. Well yeah, let me let me thank everybody that joined us for your time uh, and again apologies if we didn't get to your questions we do review them after the meeting and if we can uh, answer your specific question we will if not we'll roll it over into the next webinar uh, I do want to remind everybody participating to uh, post the Google review if you enjoyed your time today uh, and provide us your feedback via the survey and let me again thank everybody for joining us this afternoon and thank you all for what you do stay safe and be Gordon, well. Gordon thank you for a great job Allison thank great having you thanks thank everybody you. stay well